Neuroplasticity is about how the brain changes, how it can change. In essence, what we pay attention to and focus on changes certain parts of our brain and therefore the corresponding functions. There are certain portions of the brain that can be changed and they're incredibly relevant to learning and development. The hippocampus for memory recall and storage, again primarily associated with that, as well as spatial recognition. The other parts are the amygdala, which is known for the center of fight and flight and the emotional center of the brain. And then of course the prefrontal and medial frontal cortex, which is where executive functions reside, such as critical thinking or analytical reasoning, problem solving, prioritizing. And there are additional uh, parts of the brain that we can see change, which have to do with, in essence, body awareness or emotional awareness. These portions of the brain, just these three, hippocampus, amygdala, and the prefrontal and medial frontal cortex, are known to be, in essence, quote unquote, plastic. These change based on what we pay attention to and focus on. We now understand from neuroscience that we can actually train attention. As we train that attention and in essence that awareness, what one focuses on then or pays attention to does change certain structures and therefore functions of the brain. We utilize something that's incredibly accessible and has also been replicated in research. We just call it focused breathing. It's something as simple as noticing when you're breathing in and when you're breathing out and following the breath. Then gently inviting your attention into your breath or your heartbeat feeling kind of the sensation of the breath coming in and out of your out of your body it's just a great sensation of just being calm and, and serene we use focused breathing because it's something that every student carries with them it doesn't require an additional technology purchase part of the training is to invite them to become aware of when their attention has wandered from the breath and then when they notice their attention has wandered from the breath, they gently, kindly, without judgment, invite their attention back to the breath. I think, you know, doing maybe focused breathing right before the class, I think you kind of, um, you stabilize them a little bit and, you know, the, the stress and the fear is gone and they can really get involved in the experience. It comes from the very basic part of our brain that is was nurtured for survival purposes, right? Will this eat me or can I eat it? So the brain's default mode is to wander, uh, search out, search out distractions or get lost in daydreaming. When someone is learning something, whatever it might be, pick any topic, attention is needed on the task, task relevant situation. If I'm not aware that I'm rereading the same paragraph over and over, and I don't have the skill set to bring my attention back to focus on reading this paragraph, then obviously I am wasting a lot of time. Emotions actually regulate decision making and prioritizing decision making. Emotions play a role in regulating what gets stored and recalled out of memory. Whether it's because a student thinks I can't do this problem, whether it's because someone told the student you can't do the problem, or a grizzly bear just ran into the classroom, a very highly active amygdala will basically downregulate this prefrontal medial frontal cortex where executive functions reside. So inviting students into the classroom, asking them to check their emotions at the door 
uh, without giving them any tools to actually regulate their emotions is not a good idea. <laughs> emotions appear to first be expressed in the body. So my awareness of emotions is awareness of where they may be residing in my body. So the next part of the attention training involves the body awareness. And we do that through, as you can imagine, focused movement with breath or focused breath with movement, whatever is accessible to the student. And we train that so that the student begins to become aware of where emotions seem to reside in the body. When a student can become empowered about recognizing, ah, this is a worry with that has to do with this, uh, that is a, a huge piece, right? And the next part of that is once they recognize this emotion, can they on demand invite their attention back to what they want to focus on? We remind students that emotion regulation is not about suppressing emotions or ignoring them or pretending they don't, they're not there. And what that allows me to do is actually acknowledge the emotion, say hi to it, if you will, and then, then that, for some reason, allows attention to come back on demand to what I need. So you're saying, oh, okay, that's the, that's the emotion of fear, that's the emotion of frustration, and you're, you're managing it as effectively as possible. So um, I, I like that because you're, you're actually dealing with it. You're not, you're not shunning it. You're not saying, oh, get out of here, get away from me. You're, you're realizing that it's there, but you're still, uh, you're dealing with it effectively, you're managing it effectively. If I acknowledge, say, you know, high anger, high disappointment, high fear, high whatever, then I can say, I see you, and now I'm coming back to listening to this lecture, reading this paragraph. That taught me how to recognize but also allow those emotions, not to judge them. To say, in the midst of all that I'm doing, I may be confident, or I may be fearful. I may have doubts, or I may be encouraged and excited about my accomplishments. All those emotions are there and recognized and allowed, and they don't cause me to stress out and impede my progress. The third part of the training is cognitive regulation, where they begin to have this awareness of where attention is residing and can actually, we equip them with an inquiry process, discern what's true for them in this moment, what's possible for them to do about that in this moment, and then make a choice with kindness towards self and others, and then own the consequences of that choice. What's incredibly important that we're seeing from the use of attention, emotion, and cognitive regulation training is that we also train specifically for compassion. Compassion towards self and compassion toward others. And what I mean by that is that it's really correlated with this practice of non-judgment. We know that the brain is a storytelling machine and it likes to make stuff up. And when we see students take themselves out of applying themselves to a task relevant uh, process, oftentimes it has to do with the self-judgment process. Like, I can't do this, or, or they believe somebody who told them they can't do it. Right? So the compassion training process is a, a process that takes the student through really showing kindness to themselves in thought. Again, we can see the neuro neurology happen and the neurological correlates with that. And then we also, through this compassion training process, see sort of these harsh judgments melt away in a way that they can hold something 
that's possible that they never thought was possible before. Maybe that's an idea from someone I used to not like. Maybe that's my own possibility that I can do this. Through that increased compassion, um, I and another individual who came from an extremely different place and has experienced um, oppression, she's experienced racism, she's experienced disadvantages that she has truly shaped how she views herself. She and I had a conversation where she was able to share that with me. And she said that because of the compassion in the room, that was a conversation she had wanted to have her entire life. And she was able to have it with, with someone else, a fellow student. A number of modalities can be utilized to integrate these practices into each course. For a beginning class, face-to-face, uh, -face, it looks like the students coming in, they get, they get seated, and we walk them through a focused breathing practice and gently, kindly invite your attention back to your breath. If it's a classroom at the beginning of the day or after lunch or times where our biological clocks are inducing sleep or inducing you know, our energy going to digestion of food or something else, then it can look like focused breath with movement where we're actually getting the students up and moving around. And the idea again is to actually invite them to arrive in the learning and development opportunity with, ev with everything that's just happened to them before instead of check it at the door, right? Get here. Through the generosity of some private donors, we have an app that, and students have actually requested an app where they can program each practice uh, to their, to send to their schedule each day and they, so they can practice when it's convenient for them. She had us do a series of, of exercises online, uh, a lot of uh, meditation, focused breathing. Um, she also had uh, slides that she would use uh, online. And uh, it, was, it was a great experience overall. Uh, I really love the focus breathing aspect of it. And an online modality, again, we have recorded focused breathing exercises and recorded focused breathing with movement or focused movement with breath so that the student can access that perhaps before they go into the chat room or before they go onto the discussion board or something so that they're fully awake and aware of where their attention is and empowered to, on demand, return their attention back to the task when it has wandered. Right about week eight or nine, we started to observe the changes in our way of thinking, in our attention, in our compassion. I'm really inspired by how they're diving down into who they are, what they want, what their life purpose is, how they can serve, how they can apply the material, the theories that we're teaching into their world, into how they wanna make a difference. That is incredibly inspiring to me. I noticed an immediate difference um, in how I presented myself professionally, um, both as a leader and especially as a leader in group settings. Um, I think I've, I've been told many times that I am generally a positive contribution to group discussions, but really as a person, I'm extremely impatient. You know, I'm impatient that we make progress, that we be purposeful, that we be on track. And as a result of this training, although I don't think I lost my desire to be productive and purposeful, I brought a much uh, more patient presence to the room where I was much more eager to hear all the different views and allow them their space to be heard and to be considered without judgment. And I think um, that has added to my uh, my my competency as a leader. 
what Einstein said is true. The same kind of thinking that created the problems we have today is not the kind of thinking that will resolve it. And the kind of processing that these students are doing, I believe it's the kind of thinking that will resolve them. Sometimes I feel I'm, I'm a little more compassionate. Uh, I try to understand them. Um, I try to have more empathy. And I think a lot of it is, is due to the training that I had with INIQ. So we'd gather together, you know, tired, perhaps stressed out. We'd been preparing our assignments, still getting to know each other. And we would go through these mindfulness exercises. And there was just a palpable sense that we were bonding, that we were listening to each other, that we were learning together. So it completely changed really the, the whole tenor of the classroom.